Um, welcome um, to the CNBC discussion. I'm Lynn Nygaard. I'm the former um, director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture, and um, Dietz is the incoming director or the current director. Current, of yeah. The, yeah, current. It's the handoff. The, yeah. It's the handoff of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture, and we're incredibly fortunate to be able to have a discussion with um, Dr. Franz Duvall. He's Charles Howard Candler Professor of Primate Behavior in the Department of Psychology at Emory University and has been um, involved in and a friend of the, the Center for Mind, Brain and Culture for many years. So we're just so excited to be able to talk to you about your career and what you're up to currently. Oh. When I, I think about your 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 career, is I think you've spent a, a lot of years um, being kind of uh, an uh, advocate for uh, uh, the intelligence and sophistication of animals, and uh, fighting against this idea that any time we attribute any sort of intelligence to animals, we're engaged in some sort of anthropomorphism, and that this is you know this a, a huge sin for us to to do. Um, and at least from my perspective, it seems to me like you actually have had quite a bit of success in moving sort of the, the baseline of that debate. I wonder how you, do you feel like, okay, you know, I, I made some real progress here or wh how, how well? Well, it's, it's hard to distinguish what I did and what others did, you know? Yeah. So um, when I was a student, you were not allowed to talk about animal emotions, animal feelings, thinking, consciousness, any interior process was taboo. So you, that's why, why they were called the behaviorists. You know, you had to talk about the behavior of animals. That's all you could talk about. And um, in the U.S., that was a bit stronger than in Europe. In Europe, the ethologist, I'm an ethologist, they talked about instincts, which is not a big improvement in my mind. <laughs> so, so animals had instincts. And uh, in, in the U.S., animals learned a lot of things and had a lot of conditioning going on. And that was the line when I, when I came to this department, which is like 30 years ago. That was still the line at the time, even though we had uh, Dick Neisser here, who mm -hmm. was the father of cognitive psychology. That's but right. but for humans, he had to fight for that. This, this was not even for animals. This was That's right. to talk about cognition in humans and, and emotions in humans was an issue. It's interesting. So um, when I then became a student, I, I, I was fortunate to have a professor who was specialized in facial expressions. His name is Jan van Hoof, and he studied facial expressions in the primates, which automatically brings you to the emotions. It's, it's very hard to study facial expressions and not talk about emotions. So he was more open-minded on it, even though he had been warned by Tinbergen, the founder of ethology, that he should never use the word emotion. And he avoided it to some degree, but um, he was much more open-minded. And so I, I was in an environment where you could talk about these things. And um, how, how much I have moved the goalposts, you know, I don't know um, in the sense that um, it's hard to distinguish what I did from other primatologists and other scientists. You know, we have people like Jak Panksep, who worked on, on effective neuroscience. We had... Jane Goodall, who worked on chimpanzees in the wild. We, we've had a ton of other scientists who did mention emotions and cognitive processes. And they did, did not always study them explicitly. So, so many of them talked about it, and, and I was one of the ones who studied it explicitly. Um, but it's just hard to distinguish um, what I did versus what other. It was a sort of general movement away from behaviorism. And behaviorism is now, in my opinion, it's sort of dead. It's the, there are still some survivors who who rabble a lot of, make a lot of noise, but um, it's basically dead. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes these things come and go in kind of pendulum swings. It seems. Do you see any kind of indication of movement back, or do you really think it's just dead? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think uh, because behaviorism was non-evolutionary. Because for Skinner, uh, all the all the whether it was an elephant or a rat, they all it was all based on the same principles, and he he didn't care much about how animals adapted to their environment. That which would be the evolutionary question: Why do you have why do you have some animals who have a much better memory than other animals? Well, we we would have evolutionary explanations for that, and he was not interested. He was also not interested in neuroscience. So to have a cognitive science of animals that is 
has no evolution and no neuroscience in it um, becomes yeah. hard to maintain but but people have tried that but i think it's dead basically mm -hmm. yeah. um you know this idea of of you know demonstrating right um these kinds of um emotional affective or cognitive processes in animals or non-human animals mm -hmm. um what are there a couple of key findings from your own work or from other folks work that would that you think really maybe tip the scale mm -hmm. It's like iconic findings. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first finding was it was a century ago, so, so mm -hmm. long before right. uh, this came, was Sir Wolfgang Kohler, who, who mm -hmm. set up these experiments with chimps where he would hang a banana very high. He would not train the animals. He would give them sticks and boxes and see what they would do. And he claimed, some people have contested that, but he claimed that the chimps without any training would climb, stack the boxes, climb the boxes, and there's a stick right, reach, reach right. a banana. And he would say, this is all, this is not based uh -huh. on conditioning. <laughs> this is not based on, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this is based on insight in, yeah. in German, Einsicht. So, yeah. so he he assumed in an in inner process where the chimp sort of put things together right. and said, well, that's, that's how I'm going to do it, making a plan. And, um, well, he was hated, hated by the behaviorists, of course, who, who then reenacted the experiments with pigeons and had pigeons move boxes and reach a plastic banana or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the most ridiculous. Yeah, that's right. The most ridiculous reenactments they did to demonstrate that the pigeon could do basically the same thing. But which was based on that idea that Skinner had is that all animals must be behaving on the same principles. Mm -hmm. A chimp was not any better than, than a rat, so to speak. And um, so Wolfgang Kohler was the first. Mm -hmm very important he had a contemporary who was a russian woman nadia Coates, who did very similar experiments with her pet chimp she had a, a chimp in moscow uh, she's much less known she she wrote in russian and she's a woman maybe those two things combined were not good um, but i went to the museum in moscow to see her work and i was very impressed i think she mm -hmm. did uh, wonderful stuff at the same time as Kerber. so those were the early pioneers yeah and then other findings are things like the mirror test. He must have heard of it. It's <laughs> still most contested test in the world. <laughs> uh, the mirror test that was done with, with apes and then later was done with all sorts of other animals. And we were involved in that too. We, yeah. did, we did the one on elephants. Um, the mirror test is one. And then we have all these other things that, that are coming up, like planning and metacognition and uh, right. episodic yeah. memory, uh, theory of mind. And all these things in this department have come through one way or another. This is either Tomasello or me or somebody else. Right. We've all talked about these issues extensively. Um, and, and the mirror test, I, I remember, was highly controversial because ne no one wanted to believe that apes could do it, humans could do it, and then there was nothing. Because that, that's how it was presented, like, like right. it was a black and white issue. So, some, some, some species could do it and all the others couldn't do it. And now I think, uh, well, I'm part of that movement. We we want to have a more gradualist perspective, because you know we have elephants and magpies and some fish. Mm -hmm. and the, 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 we have all sorts of other species who do not necessarily pass the test, but they pass things that seem like the test. Yeah. Right, precursors. Yeah. Right, and the test is the mirror test yeah. for you know folks who might be watching. The mirror, this, the mirror right? test. You put a mark on an animal that they mm -hmm. cannot see without a mirror. So right. you put it for humans, you put it here, for example. Mm -hmm. And then you put them in front of a mirror. And, and a child of over 20 months usually can, can pass the test mm -hmm. and, and connects the mirror image with its own face and starts to rub the place. Right. But if you do it with an elephant, they can also pass the test. Not all elephants, but some elephants pass the right. test. But initially, it was just the apes and humans. And even mm -hmm. some apes, like the gorillas, they didn't do it. <laughs> And then the people that wrote whole papers about what happened to the gorilla. That's why well, the unfortunate gorilla. Yeah, oh no. <laughs> they must be a bit dumb, you know. Uh, now we have several gorillas who passed the test. And right. I think the issue with the gorillas was that they don't like to look straight at themselves or straight in the eyes of yeah. anybody. 
Yeah. And uh, they, uh, as a result, they could. And so, if you angle the mirror or you put a camera on them so that they see their own face under an angle, then all of a sudden things seem to, seem to change. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, um, the mirror test was one of those things that set things in motion. Another very important moment in this history is uh, the language studies, mm -hmm. even though that's again very contested. <laughs> yeah. So the language studies came along with Washu, the chimp. And um, I, I always look at that as a very anthropocentric enterprise, is that we humans, we are good at language and tool use. Uh, and, and we are excellent at it. And, and language is, in my opinion, actually a uniquely human capacity. But we are very good at both. And, and we judge other animals by that. And so tool use, like the Kohler test, yes, that we are impressed by that. And if an animal can use tools, we, we think that they must be smart. And then language uh, is something that we use every day, all the time. We're using it at the moment. Right. So um, language is also something that impresses us. But other capacities, like if you take uh, echolocation of the bat, you, you darken yes. this room, you release an insect, the bat can catch it. I think it's, it's absolutely remarkable. It's, it's a, um, a performance of high cognition because, because the bat needs to correct for its own speed of movement, needs to detect the insect, need to, to catch it in the end. Um, echolocation is a very complex capacity, but we are not impressed by it because we don't do it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so, so there are certain capacities in animals that, yeah, blah. At first it's blah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but others like language, oh, yeah, we, we all get excited right. about it. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yes, bats can identify the type of insect mm -hmm. with echolocation. Yeah, right. Also. So really sophisticated. Yeah, and the insects they develop their own counter strategy. That's right. That's right. So yeah, in a way, you kind of uh, anticipated something that 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 I was going to to ask you about. Uh, you know, um, there's. Uh, You've, you've achieved a lot, and it's very interesting in talking about what we share with other animals. But of course, there's also a lot of interest in, you know, in what ways humans are different. You know that uh, uh, each species, of course, is unique. And so I was going to ask, um, well, given that we share so much with particularly other apes, in what ways are are humans different from other apes? And you mentioned language and tool use, and Maybe it'll also be interesting as well. How are chimpanzees different from humans? What mm -hmm. are the other apes that excel? So what what are the most interesting to you differences between the species? Yeah, the differences, you know, I, I resist that very often because the, uh, among anthropologists, mm -hmm. and you're an anthropologist. Indeed. That's the issue. <laughs> that's the issue they want to talk about. And, and they have entire meetings on that, how special humans are. They write entire books about it, like Joe Henry, a former member of the, of the faculty here, the success of the human species or something, books like that. Um, even though, you know, if you look at the climate change that we have at the moment, the success of the human species is a bit questionable in my mind. But um, but yeah, the, the, the anthropologists, they push this agenda of humans are special, they are different. How are they different? Where are they different? And the differences dwindle constantly. So for example, um, for a long time, uh, some scientists argued that that theory of mind was uniquely human. S theory of mind being that you can understand the intentions and the knowledge of somebody else. Um, even though the term theory of mind came out of chimp research, it was developed by uh, Primak and Woodruff based on a chimp study. But then um, after all these years, they concluded that only humans have it. Now we're back to the point where with very smart tests with eye tracking that they did with apes, we believe that theory of mind does exist in the apes at the same level as, as two or three-year-old children. So, so, so all these differences tend to dwindle. They, they are postulated. And then uh, five years later, the scientists who work on animals, they say, well, actually, you know, um, you have to weaken the claim a little bit. And, th and that's what they do. They weaken the claim. So I think humans are very special in, in some ways, especially the scale of the society. That's unique that we live in societies of a million people and are able to organize that and, and not kill each other on the street the whole day, you know. Uh, so, so that's <laughs> remarkable. 
So, so we, we were able to live in these large scale societies and we have language and we have more culture. And we, we're not the only ones with culture, but we have more of it for sure than other species. So I do consider humans special, but humans are animals. And that's often forgotten also by the anthropologists. Humans are animals. They, um, they act very often, and that's a tradition in Western philosophy. The actors of humans are not animals. And so Western philosophy has created a lot of trouble, in my opinion, by making this sharp dividing line between humans and other species. Uh, but, you know, we have brains and hearts and lungs, and we have certainly animal bodies, but we also have animal minds, in my opinion. And so the emphasis that I see in some groups, like, for example, anthropology has words like humanization. How, how do you become human? Or how do you call it? Anthropogenes? Uh, anthrop how do you pronounce it? Uh, Genesis. Anthropogenesis. Anthropogenesis. Yeah. I think there's... Uh... Yeah. yeah, so they have special words about becoming human, which I, I find problematic. We don't have their word for elephants, uh, elephant or something like that. <laughs> we don't have these words. So, although elephant is a very special animal, very unique. So yeah, we, we live in a time where I think um, psychology is rapidly changing because the psychology departments have gotten a lot of neuroscience. And the neuroscientists know that a rat brain and a human brain operate basically the same way. We have a bigger brain, but it's not a different brain. Uh, so uh, in psychology, there's a greater openness now for evolution and the connection between humans and animals. But anthropology needs to follow somehow. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah uh... I, well, I think there is a tradition of evolutionary anthropology. Uh, yeah, yeah, the physical yeah. <laughs> anthropologist, of course, the physical anthropologies there are a bit different often, yeah. Um, I do wonder um, if you were to think about chimpanzees and try to play the same game, is there anything you say, well, this is, you know, a distinctively chimpanzee thing that humans don't do or, or can't do, or mm. uh, it's, you know, if you were to chimpanzeogenesis, <laughs> what, what, would, what would be your target yeah, yeah. of explanation? I don't know these chimpanzees, uh, if it's not physical, because mm -hmm. chimpanzees have some physical characteristics, like the, the, the physical strength yeah. is just incredible. Uh, if, it, if it's not that, what they have that we don't have, I'm, I'm not sure. They, 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 they don't have nuclear families, so they're able to organize a society without mm -hmm. male, female, children mm -hmm. type arrangements. And that's true for many primates, of course. We humans, we have set that up very differently. So, um, no, I'm not sure that I, I could name capacities in the chimpanzees. Certainly the, their senses are very acute. Uh, and that's what every field worker will tell you is that they can sense things in the environment that we don't sense. Uh, but that's also, they grow up there. And, and so if, if, if a human yeah. would grow up under the same circumstances, who knows? Our senses are not deficient, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, and this is, yeah, you play the game either way and it often comes down to that. Well, you know, you're living in a very different environment, have very different history of experiences. What's due to being in different species? What's due to a different experience? Very hard to. to the experience the that's often underrated. Uh, the, the role of experience and culture in the primates. So, for example, if you release. I've had capuchin monkeys for a long time, if you would release one of these groups of let's say 20, 20 capuchin monkeys and you put them in, in a forest in Costa Rica or whatever, they will not survive. The capuchin monkeys out of my lap, they will not survive. And um, that, that is because they need to learn so many things and they, that's why the, the primates have such a slow development. Like the monkeys are usually adults when they're maybe six or, or eight and, and the apes are adults when they're 16. So they have a very slowed down development, partly because they need to learn so many things in order to survive. And so the idea that people sometimes have is that humans are cultural beings. Mm -hmm. And so we are, our survival is very dependent on transmitted knowledge. But the same is true for many species. If they, if they didn't grow up and didn't learn the tricks of their environment uh, early on, uh, they have no chance of survival. So that's sometimes underestimated. People think that they use the word instinct a lot. They think everything in animals is instinctive. 
but in animal behavior, we don't use the term anymore instinctive because there's almost nothing that doesn't have a learning component and, and a transmission component to it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think uh, you may be referring to, for instance, people talk about lost, ex lost European explorers who can't survive because they don't have the cultural knowledge. Yet. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, yeah, if there are series of animal anecdotes that might be quite similar, actually. Well, I heard recently a, um, a story from the, from a Japanese colleague, and I don't think it's documented in the literature, certainly not in English, uh, is that they moved one time a group of um, macaques, Japanese macaques, from an island to the mainland and released them in the forest in the mainland, and they all died. Because it was a very different mm -hmm. environment than these, these half tropical islands that they have. I, I thought it was most remarkable, but I've never seen it documented. But it sounds plausible to yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your latest book, right? Uh -huh. um, which is entitled Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. And what intrigued you about this particular topic? How did you come around to doing this? This is your next book project. Well, it's, there's two things to it. Mm -hmm. One is that if I give lectures about primate behavior, uh, I can't avoid talking about sexism and saying that females do more of this and males do more of that. And people always want to know more about that. Right. They're, they're curious. There's a curiosity about gender that is not satisfied by uh, the blogs that they read or the media that they read, mm -hmm. where I think um, gender differences are downplayed. And so in psychology, in this department also, <laughs> I've seen many lectures <laughs> where people talk about behavior. Right. Uh, they, they're very shy about yeah. gender differences. And so uh, even though boys play very differently from girls, there's lots of evidence that boys wrestle more and roughhouse more than girls. Right. That's uh, I recently I got a, a handbook on developmental psychology and I said, let's see what they say about gender. There were only two or three entries about gender. Yeah, it's as if all these kids develop in exactly the same way. Yeah. So, so in psycho th that's a combination. In psychology, it's downplayed and people are shy about it. And in, uh, in the general public, there's, a, there's an enormous curiosity mm -hmm. about what is the biology of gender differences. Right. And um, I thought, well, as a primatologist, I have maybe a bit more freedom to talk about it because I can just say how it is in the primates. Because in primatology, we're not shy about sex differences at all. We talk mm -hmm. about them all the time. Right, right. So I thought I can do that. And then I bring in some human literature, which turns to be much more extensive than I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too extensive Indeed. almost. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I brought that in. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and in that book, Funny enough, I, I had not anticipated while writing it that I would get into gender diversity, like uh, transgender people or homosexual yeah. orientation. Uh, I, I saw that would not be my main issue, but I, and it ended up being becoming an issue in the book because I actually know so many cases of individuals who have more homosexual than heterosexual behavior or individuals who are not uh, following the typical role path on, of their species. And so I thought it's interesting to throw that in there. So I, right. so gender diversity became an issue also in the book. So, um, you know, kind of, you know, echoing back to the, you know, difference or non-differences, right, yeah. between um, sort of human primates and non-human primates. Or, um, what, what, would, what was the what do you think the kind of take home message from your deep dive into this, um, if you'd be willing to talk about it? Well, the, the, the basic message is that we need to have biology in the gender discussion. Yeah. We cannot discuss gender as if it's some sort of invention. Right. Uh, I think it remains always tied to sex, even though uh, it's a loose connection, clearly, because yeah. gender is more cultural and sex is more biological. So it's a loose connection. Uh, and, and, and the opinions about it change almost by the day. Um, but I think we cannot discuss gender without bringing biology in there. And one way of bringing biology in the discussion is to see what is universally human. And, and I think anthropologists would 
be able to talk about that? What is universally human in, 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 in behavior, the differences between the two? What do we see in other primates? And what do we see in very early child development before all these cultural influences really right. become very important? Right. And, and I think we have data on that. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's an interesting thing to explore. And we shouldn't be shy about it. I don't see why, why we would be that. And because my opinion is that, that if there are differences between the genders, and I'm, I'm sure there are, um, that's not necessarily a reason to approve of the situation in the current um, society. Right. If you're not happy with the, with the gender relation in current society, and many people are not happy about it, uh, uh, the fact that there are differences is not a reason to approve of them. Yeah. Have you gotten pushback? The thing is that, strangely enough, I had expected to have pushback. Um, most people who read the book are quite enthusiastic. Some mm -hmm. of the reviews are very positive. Some of the reviews are half critical, half positive. Yeah. But I haven't seen reviews that are completely rejecting the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think, actually, my book is more problematic for people who... Uh, argue against gender diversity mm -hmm. than for traditional feminists. Because within feminism, as you probably know, you have a ton of different uh, uh, opinions. Yeah. It's not a monolithic block of yeah. opinions. So, so yeah, you have you also have even gender critical feminists nowadays. Yes. Uh, <laughs> for me, very hard to deal with that. But um, but within feminism, I think there's much less resistance to this than uh, in the people who, like, let's say, uh, in Florida, you have this uh, senator, ex-senator, ex senator, what is his name, Chris or something, or Chris, what's his name? There's a politician there. Yeah, who, who, Was he the no, he's, he's, not, not, the yeah, he's yeah. not the one who's now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, there, there's a, there was a senator there who, who said you have men and women, and that's all you have. <laughs> and, and, and of course, that's, that's a sort of traditional view. It's like you have men, women, men love women, women love men, and that's all we need, right. and that's all we have. Uh, and, and so they want to simplify uh, things to, to create a gender binary that everyone knows is questionable. Right, right. Uh, and, and it's already questionable at the biological level. If we, right. if we look at the sexes, there yeah. it's already questionable. Right. So let alone at, at the gender level where we right. look at the cultural uh, situation and the cultural expression. So, so yeah, those people actually have probably more trouble because I'm, I don't argue, for example, that men ought to be dominant over women. I don't argue that... Um, everyone ought to be heterosexual. So, so in that sense, I think they have more trouble with the book. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I can imagine for some people even to apply the term gender to animal societies would be controversial. Uh, yeah. you know, so gender is a cultural construct distinct from. Uh, so uh, how do you uh, deal with that in, in the book? In what sense does it make sense to, to talk about gender in animal societies and behavior? Well, if, if, if a chimp or a bonobo is adult when they're 16, that means that they learn a lot of things in their life. That means that can include uh, gender typical behavior. And we actually have some evidence for that. We have a handful of studies that show that female primates imitate their mother more than the, than the sons do. So, so, for example, a recent study on uh, orangutans in the forest showed that the daughters have exactly the same diet as their moms. It's because they copy exactly what she's eating. And the sons deviate from her diet, probably because they watch, and, and they have evidence for that, they watch males more who, who come by and eat different things. So, so we do have evidence in, the, in these cultural traditions of tool use and, and, and diet choices that uh, young females pay more attention to their mom than, your, than sons do. Uh, and that can extend to all sorts of behavior. Uh, it, it's easier to demonstrate in these areas, but it can extend also to intimidation behavior, aggressive behavior, caretaking behavior. I document in my book extensively how young primate females are very attracted to infants. And if you give them dolls, they will use them as dolls and, and hold them and carry them whereas the males don't do these things. 
And so, and so they learn the maternal skills also from their mother. And, and that's essential. Uh, we know that in a, in a zoo, if you have a group of gorillas and one of them gets pregnant and this group has never had a baby, we know that that female is not going to take care of the baby. She's going to either reject it or sit on it or she's going to she's going to be a bad mom and you probably have to take the baby away. So uh, we know that uh, maternal skills need to be learned. And so that's that's another reason why females will pay more attention to their mom and to adult females around them. So I think socialization, self-socialization, as I call it, is common in the primates. And we haven't studied this very much. Um, there's another interesting example. That's uh, Elizabeth Lonsdorf. I hear that you have yeah, her on the just, faculty now. She's joined our department, yes. She wrote a paper, I think it's 10 years ago, about how uh, young female chimpanzees perform exactly the same technique of a termite fishing as their mothers do, and the sons don't. So, so that's another yeah, example. Yeah. So, so I think the, the young females pay attention to adult females and the young males to adult males, and that's how you get some self-socialization going, which means that gender also applies to the primates because then gender expression is partly cultural. Right. So it's, it's learned and uh, there might be a, a, a biological component in sort of an intentional bias with variation yeah. uh, that kind of channels it. To yeah, this, so the unfortunate part of this is that it doesn't simplify the story. Right. It means, because people sometimes think if you look at the primates, you see biology. Right. And you look at humans, mm -hmm. you see culture. And actually, if you look at the primates, you see culture also. And if you look at humans, you see biology also. So it's, it's not a simple story. That can be told. Yeah. So, uh, but that's in science very often the case. Things are always more complex than you think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so that uh, kind of, you know, in some sense we've we've learned quite a lot about uh, the apes and, and other primates uh, over the years. And in another sense, there's so much more that we still need to learn. And of course, you can't really talk about any of this without thinking about. The future and and the prospects for future science for future survival of, of particularly apes uh, mm -hmm. in the wild and in captivity. What do you see as the future prospects? Yeah, that's um, the situation in the wild is not good at all. Uh, many people are very pessimistic about it. So, so for example, orangutans uh, in the last twenty years, a hundred thousand orangutans have disappeared from Borneo. Uh, which is more than half the population, and, and I think the situation is very similar to many of the uh, many of the apes. So they're really under pressure. Hopefully, we can have big reserves that don't have too many poachers, and and they can survive there. Uh, and then you have the captive groups. Um, I, I don't look at that as a replacement for the wild groups. Um, uh, I've always worked in captivity, and I think there are excellent captive colonies, for example, for bonobos, we have some in France, for chimpanzees, we have some in the Netherlands and in the US. So, so, so we do have good captive groups that can be studied, but they don't replace, uh, it would be very sad if, if that's all we would have, you know. Uh, so, so we all hope that we can keep the animals going in the wild, but um, it doesn't look good at the moment. Yeah, it is a, a dire situation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you see any rays of hope or at least the best options or where are the, the, the most positive efforts? Well, there, there are sometimes little victories like uh, the, the, um, the palm nut situation, you know, um, uh, palm oil is slightly improving, I think, at the moment, but I think it's all a struggle and and they still are burning down for us massively in Indonesia. So and 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 there's development going in the DRC, the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the, the developments that they want to open up an entire forest there. So, so yeah, um there are places that seem to be doing okay, but um, how long they will last, I don't know. Um, so Franz, you have been at this for a little while, mm -hmm. um, and you've had a, a long career in primatology and comparative psychology. So 
what's missing from our story? What are those unanswered questions that are still, you know, still buzzing around, you know, your head? Yeah, I, I think at the moment there, 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 there's a, an enormous amount of good research on cognition. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really taking off and not just limited to the primates. There's all sorts of animals are being studied uh, at the cognitive yeah. level. And emotion research is coming up at the moment. It's, um, it used to be uh, looked at uh, as like emotions are mushy and, and ill-defined and we don't know what to do with them. But I think there's increasingly research on that. I, th I think we need to bring in some neuroscience, non-invasive neuroscience, uh, as, as, at least on the primates, I would say, is that um, we do a lot of non-invasive neuroscience on humans nowadays. We have a scanner here in this building. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we need to take that direction with the primates uh, so that they can voluntarily go into a situation um, and uh, like a scanner. And maybe these scanners will become smaller and more manageable than they are now. Uh, so I think that's that's a, a way to go to uh, to understand better the cognition and the emotions of animals. Uh, at the moment, we're a bit stuck with that. Um, how to do that? And and the neuroscience that does occur on on animals is invasive, and I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah. yeah. And so emotions. Yeah. Oh, I just I just have to ask. Uh, you know, you're um, talking about uh, having uh, uh, primates in the scanner uh, voluntarily. I mean, do you see? I, I can't even picture the, <laughs> the scenario, honestly. Well, with a chimp, it would be hard because you you don't want to have a chimp running up around in the, in the hospital yeah. uh, <laughs> so uh, but I know that there are labs there's a lab in France that is training macaques to uh, to sit still in yeah, the scanner yeah. and and you know here we're training dogs or yeah, they yeah, did yeah, that yeah. with dogs and so yeah dog is domesticated animal so that makes it already a lot easier uh, but I think that's the that's the direction we're going to go okay yeah that uh it sounds intriguing. It's, it does seem challenging. <laughs> it's very, it's very challenging. But there are places that are doing yeah. okay with it. So I think it's going to happen one day. Uh, but um, the way that neuroscience was done on the primates, I've, I've never uh, felt comfortable with that. And, and also, uh, I always looked at it as as a bit primitive. It's like the, it's, some scientists they would remove a part of the brain, and then. Uh, they felt that they could detect from what then happened, what that part of the brain was doing. But I'm not sure if I take a part of my car, if I take a part of, out of the engine uh, and drive around and uh, what do I know? What do I learn from that? I'm not sure what I learned from that. Yeah. I may still be driving or I may be standing still. So, so <laughs> <laughs> the spark the plug is the seat of intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what sort of, um, say, say you could, you know, say it was possible to put or to ask a chimpanzee to participate in, a, say, a neuroimaging experiment. What do you think that would tell us about emotion, for example? Well, for example, one of the questions we have is is mm -hmm. the distinction between emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. Right. So recently, a major scientist in the field of animal emotions, uh, Joseph Ledoux. Mm -hmm. He has argued that um, we shouldn't be talking about emotions in rats, even though all his life he's talked about fear in rats. We shouldn't use that word anymore because we don't know what the rats feel, which is a question. We don't know yeah. what they feel. Yeah. For me, that's not a reason not to talk about fear in rats, because I assume that if the rats have, have all these same responses that we have when we're fearful, uh, and, and the same parts of the brain are involved. It's, it's very hard for, for me to argue that that's not fear, what they have and what we have is fear. But um, the distinction between emotion and feelings is an, an important issue and has to do with consciousness. It's mm -hmm. like, how, how conscious are you of your emotions? And um, I think neuroscience could solve some of these issues. If, if, um, if human neuroscience can tell us which parts of the brain are involved in a certain emotional response that we feel and that we can report on, uh, then if, if the same areas and the same constellation of areas is involved in, in an animal under similar circumstances, 
we have to assume that the same feelings are involved. So I, I think um, neuroscience can help us solve that riddle a little bit. It's like, what do animals feel? We, that they have emotions is pretty clear because emotions are expressed in the body and you can measure that. So, so the emotion part uh, is not hard, but the feeling part is very difficult. And, and we got involved into this discussion uh, recently um, together with Kristen Andrews, a philosopher, wrote in science on the emotions of invertebrates because that has become an issue yeah it's like uh, are we allowed to to boil a lobster yeah because people say lobsters don't feel pain is that a, a reasonable right. statement to make and we don't think it's reasonable to think that lobsters don't feel pain we think we, we think there's quite a bit of evidence that they do yeah. uh, process uh, pain responses so, so that discussion is is Yes, the lobster may react in a way that make it seem that he has fear and pain, um, but we don't think that uh, lobsters feel anything. That, that that sort of position, I think, is is harder to maintain now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that whole discussion is is partly a philosophical discussion. Philosophers play a big role in that whole discussion, like. What is the consciousness of animals? How do we measure that? How do we determine that they have some level of consciousness? Um, and the thing for me is, you know, I don't know what consciousness is personally. So, so I always say this is, of course, um, not very nice to say that to uh, people, but I say, you tell me what consciousness is, and I tell you if the elephant has it. <laughs> and I never get a good, it's good answer. <laughs> I never get a good answer. So because people blab a lot about consciousness, and I yeah. really don't know what it is. Yeah, I know, I know my own consciousness. That's about all I know. Yeah. I think I have it. Yeah, yeah, but you yeah. you could be a zombie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. How, how would, what would be my test? <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah tell me exactly um mm. yes well i don't have an answer yeah. maybe no, we, we haven't progressed much um no i just I, you know I, you you mentioned the distinction between emotion and feeling uh and i actually thought you were going to kind of go the other it almost seems easier to me to identify feeling as being present um than emotion um and Maybe I'm because I know that in the, the study of human emotion, there's increasingly sort of the controversy over whether basic emotions that have long been assumed are, are actually really basic and biologically endowed and associated with certain facial expressions, or whether much of what we call emotion is culturally constructed. And the, the real experience of how we interpret our feeling would be different in different yeah. cultural yeah. contexts. And um, of course, if that's true, then it raises additional issues of you know what, what we can ever hope to know about what's going on really experientially for other animals. Uh, so I don't know if you have any 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 feelings about uh, the status of the basic emotions <laughs> or whether they're generalizable or not. A lot of the psych research nowadays is on feelings, yeah. not emotions. They, they put people behind a computer and they have to answer questions. Mm -hmm. And they, they, how would you feel under these circumstances? Or how do you react to this image or, or things like that? And, and what do you feel? And, and so th there's a linguistic interface there, which complicates things terribly, in my opinion. Um, I, I'm more for behavioral experiments and, and the body, because emotions are always in the body. Mm -hmm. If I bring a tiger into this room, you're going to have certain responses that I can measure. And that are the same in all humans. So, so, so yeah, I know, I know the theories that emotions are culturally constructed, but your response to a, a live tiger, uh, especially one that growls a little bit, Bleeding, is, uh, yeah, <laughs> is gonna be predictable and, and uh, increased heart rate, blood pressure, uh, cold feet, you know, the, the, the blood is withdrawn from the extremities and in rats, cold yeah. tail, you know, um, your fear response is predictable and, and the parts of the brain that are involved are predictable. And so, yeah, you can talk about cultural construction as much as you want, and I, I know these theories, but the body responses are pretty um, uh, definitive and, and well-defined. So, yeah, so um, I prefer uh, tests of emotions that are more based on the, on the physical reactions. 
and the feelings are your interpretation of those those mm -hmm. reactions. So yeah, yeah, so the feelings, of course, are culturally variable. Right. You may have learned to call it fear, but somebody else may have learned to call it um, anxiety or right. they, they may, or, yeah. yeah, they may or uh, or, they, or they may want to downplay their fear right. um, because the, in their culture you don't have fear. Um, yeah, so so the the feeling responses that you report, of course, they are culturally variable. And since psychology has so is focusing so much now on the feelings more than the emotions, uh, they they have gotten confused, I think. Okay. And, and in that sense, I'm so happy I work with animals who cannot report. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an advantage. That's good. People do talk a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what everyone else um, so what's next? Well, well at the moment, I'm, I'm very, uh, very much um, promoting the book and mm -hmm. giving lectures mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. After that, I don't know. You don't have a an idea that's well. I, on I, I'm playing with the idea that I need to write about alpha males. You know, the the word alpha male came became popular after my book Chimpanzee Politics. It, it existed before that time, but it became popular with that and. Uh, very often people have the wrong idea about alpha males. And, and since in the in politics, we have uh, some very interesting alpha males uh, in the past and in the present, and alpha females actually also. Uh, so um, maybe I need to return to that topic. Interesting. Uh, although it's, it's gonna be tough to do that without being political. But uh, maybe if I discuss human alpha males, I, I need to stick with the past rather than the present. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, would be, that might be the, be the safe, <laughs> safe action. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think people would be interested either way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you you can get into deep trouble if you uh, discuss the present political situation. Yeah. Mm. Or sell a lot of books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah. both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that we appreciate all of the time and energy you have spent having this discussion. This was fantastic. Um, and thank you so much, Franz, for doing this. We really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. I enjoyed it. <laughs>